calling us to order for tonight's program. As many of you know, I'm Gloria Duffy, President and CEO of the Commonwealth Club. I'll be our chair for this evening's program. You know that you can find the Commonwealth Club online at commonwealthclub.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, on the club's YouTube channel, and lots of other places. It's now my pleasure to introduce tonight's distinguished speaker, John Byerly, U.S. Ambassador to Russia from 2008 through 2012, and currently Board Director of the U.S. Russia Foundation and my esteemed colleague from prior years. We meet at a time when issues involving Russia are central concerns in American policy uh, and uh, public awareness. Vladimir Putin has just won a fourth and possibly final term as Russia's president. And today, Ambassador Byerly will talk with us about the many issues uh, about Russia today and in the post-Putin era and the many issues that currently affect U.S.-Russian relations. I know you and our audience will have many questions about the Russia issues that are in the news every day. John Byerly is a Russia expert whose knowledge and experience is deep and wide. He served as an American diplomat for more than three decades in foreign postings and domestic assignments, focused on Central and Eastern Europe, the Soviet Union, and Russia. In addition to serving as ambassador to Russia, he was ambassador to Bulgaria. While serving as ambassador to Russia, he led the implementation of policies that resulted in improved U.S.-Russian relations back in the days that those that, that happened, <laughs> uh, including the signing of the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, or START, Russia's accession to the World Trade Organization, and liberalized visa formalities. His diplomatic service included two earlier tours at the U.S. Embassy in Moscow, uh, and one of those, he was the Deputy Chief of Mission. He also served as Counselor for Political and Economic Affairs at the U.S. Embassy in the Czech Republic and a member of the U.S. Delegation to the Negotiations for the Treaty on Conventional Armed Forces in Europe. In Washington, he served as Special Advisor to the Secretary of State for the New Independent States and Director for Russian, Ukrainian, and Eurasian Affairs on the staff of the National Security Council. As a staff officer in the 1980s, he traveled extensively with former Secretaries of State George Shultz and James Baker. Ambassador Byerly received the Presidential Distinguished Service Award from President Obama and currently serves on the board of directors of the U.S.-Russia Foundation for Economic Advancement and the Rule of Law. Please welcome our distinguished guest, Ambassador John Byerly. Thanks, Claire. Thanks, Thank you very much, Gloria, for that uh, full introduction. So I, I do feel a little bit old sometimes, but it's a great, it's really a great honor to be here in the Commonwealth Club, which I recently learned is the oldest public policy uh, organization in the United States. Oldest public forum. Old, oldest public forum in the United States. Uh, and it's really wonderful to see a good crowd out, as, as usually happens when I speak about Russia these days. One of the things uh, for those of us who speak about Russia is you have to do a lot less setup and a lot less context explaining than you used to. Everyone's kind of up on what's happening with uh, Russia these days. Uh, Putin, I also enjoyed the chuckle that went through the room when uh, Gloria said a fourth and perhaps final term. <laughs> Indeed, uh, Putin's re-election this past Sunday did give a very clear answer to one question that no one in, in uh, Moscow or in Washington was asking, who is actually going to win this election? <laughs> I was in Moscow about a month ago, and I actually heard a joke that was kind of making the rounds. What is the difference between presidential elections in the United States and presidential elections in Russia? The answer is, in the U.S., everyone understands the basic rules for conducting elections, but no one knows who's going to win. Witness November 2016. In Russia, it's just the opposite. Everyone knows who's going to win, but nobody knows exactly how they're going to manage to pull it off, <laughs> at least not in advance. But now, if we, if we look back now, actually, at the results, we can now make a few judgments about, about how the Kremlin chose to manage the outcome of this election, and then assess what it tells us about a question that many Russians, many Americans, many people around the world are asking. 
how and when will a successor to Vladimir Putin appear on the scene and how will that transition take place? And for us in the United States, the question is really, what do we need to look out for as this transition to a post-Putin era begins to take place? So those are the questions that I'd like to take a look at tonight. And to do so, I want to take a look at three specific factors or, or groupings that ought to have some influence on these questions. First, the political opposition in Russia, the people who would actually be chosen to be successors to Putin. The people of Russia, they ought to have some say in this, after all. And then the Russian power elite, those who would themselves actually like to do the choosing and might actually like to be among the ones chosen. So first, we'll take a look at the political opposition. And sadly, it is probably the least important factor in this mix. The main point to make here, I think, is that over the last 18 years, Vladimir Putin has been successful beyond any measure in creating the illusion that political pluralism exists in Russia, when in fact, there's no such thing as a competitive presidential election or any electoral system, really. There are a lot of political parties in Russia. Uh, there are six parties that are represented in the parliament, in the Duma. But the only party that really matters in Russia is the party of power, United Russia, which has 75% of the seats in the Duma and 71% of the governorships. In this past election on Sunday, there were seven candidates running against Putin. Now, to get on the ballot for president in Russia, you need to be from one of the established parties, or if you're an independent, you need to gather about 300,000 signatures, have them verified. But, and here there's a big unwritten rule, your candidacy cannot be seen to pose any kind of actual threat to take away a substantial number of votes for the incumbent president. If you do pose that kind of a threat, then a way will be found to keep you off the ballot. So let's take a look briefly at the main candidates who were allowed to run against Putin, something akin to sparring partners, maybe, uh, not real heavyweights. Uh, and we'll also look at the one who was kept off the ballot. The top vote getters in this past election on Sunday are almost irrelevant to any discussion of the post-Putin era because they won't be part of it. They represent the past. The candidates on the two extremes, the ultra-nationalist on the far right, the longtime economic reformer on the political left, they're both in their 70s. They've been running against Putin for 18 years, and they were beaten again handily on Sunday. One got 5%, one got 1%, and this is probably it for them. And maybe this may be it for their parties as well. The Communist Party, which perennial, perennially runs a candidate, uh, actually pulled something new this year. They replaced its longtime candidate, their long-term candidate, with a new face, an entrepreneur in his 50s who runs some big fruit farms outside of Moscow. This was the man that was dubbed the communist millionaire. And the novelty factor of that alone proved to be a boon for the communists. They got 12%. But if you look, if you do a demographic, a demographic analysis of the support base for the Communist Party in Russia, it, it really only moves in one direction and it's not up. So I think the only interesting, or for this discussion, the only relevant aspect of the election was the contest and the contrast between the two younger faces of the would-be political opposition in Russia. And really, it's a contrast between revolution versus evolution. Representing evolution was a woman named Ksenia Sobchak. She's in her mid-30s. She's an ex-reality TV star who's now rather successfully refashioned herself in her mid-30s as a news anchor, a blogger, and a journalist. She has a big following on Russia's social media, as you would expect. And because she really, she only got 1% of the vote, she posed no threat to Putin at all, the Kremlin allowed her to run. Her message to the voters was pretty simple. We all know that I can't win. So consider me to be your vote against all, a challenge to the system to open up over time to people like us who really are committed to change in Russia. 
Her main opponent in this was really not Putin at all. Her main opponent was a, another political activist, another opposition figure called Alexei Navalny. Most people have probably heard of Navalny. He is a, an activist and a blogger who has really created a genuine, well-organized political movement across Russia based on anti-corruption themes. He also has a huge following on social media, and his charisma and his organizing skills have made him really the only political figure in Russia that the Kremlin actually fears. So, naturally, he was not allowed to be on the ballot. Which suited Navalny fine because he was calling for a boycott of the vote as an illegitimate farce. Navalny does not want to work within the system. He doesn't want to help the existing system evolve. He wants to blow up the, the, the system. And he and a lot of others saw Ksenia Sobchak not as a true opposition candidate, but as something of a, of a Kremlin stooge, a, a device that Putin bought and paid for to boost the turnout, which would make the vote look more legitimate. Whether she was a stooge or not, the net effect was to further split the political opposition in Russia, further marginalize it, all the while maintaining the illusion of political pluralism, which is actually happening in an environment of total Kremlin control. And as the years roll on, 18 years and counting now, Putin and the people around him just seem to get better and better at doing this. And a large part of the reason that they do is tied to their mastery of the information space in Russia. And that leads us to the second factor that I mentioned that should ideally have some impact on this succession question, and that's the views of the Russian people themselves. They're important because the Kremlin, Putin, and the people around him recognize that in some way they do derive their legitimacy from the support of the 140 plus million members, citizens of the Russian Federation. And although the election last Sunday was, as I mentioned, in no way a competitive political contest, it was vital as a demonstration of Putin's popularity, a kind of reaffirmation of the political polls that regularly show him to be uh, supported by 80, 81, 82 percent of the Russian people. It is worth remembering, however, that just four years ago in 2014, those approval ratings for Putin were much lower. They were somewhere down around 55 percent. At that time, there was a combination of economic factors led by a steep recession, falling energy prices, record high inflation, and all of this provoked something new in Russia. For the first time, people started talking about Putin fatigue. It began with Putin's return to the presidency for a third term in 2012, just as I was leaving as ambassador. Uh, but it ended rather decisively in 2014 as a direct result of Russia's annexation of Crimea. Within a month, Putin's approval rating jumped from 55% to 80%. And it really has never dropped much since then. Continued military adventurism by Russia, first in Ukraine, then in Syria, has reinforced the underlying message here to the Russian people and to the world. Putin is restoring Russia's lost status as a global great power that has a voice and a veto on the major international questions of the day. That message obviously has a lot of popular resonance. But the Russian economy is still struggling. Uh, household incomes fell again in 2017 for the fourth straight year. Interestingly, though, Putin receives almost none of the blame for that. While his approval ratings have stayed up in the 80s, in fact, over the last two years, we've seen the ratings for the government, the prime minister, parliament, and regional governors all plummet. And a lot of this is a consequence of how well the Kremlin manages the information space and the media in Russia. A strong majority of Russians get their information from television. 80% of Russians get their view of the outside world and their view of their own country from state-run TV. And 22, 20 out of the 22 main broadcast channels are run by state media holding companies. They help to channel any potential popular dissatisfaction with Putin away, like kind of like a pressure escape valve. 
So as long as Putin can fire unpopular governors, replace ministers, people will give him the benefit of the doubt. He, in fact, has, over the past six months, replaced 10 percent of Russia's regional governors with a younger generation. And as long as he can do that, his popularity probably will be able to withstand any unhappiness over the pocketbook issues that Russians, as much as any other people, complain about. Now, there are two other aspects to consider as we look at the role of the Russian people in all of this and the durability of Putin's popular appeal. The first is a demographic curiosity. Putin's strongest base of popular support is found among those Russians aged 18 to 24 who cannot remember anyone else leading their country and who really have no memory of the Soviet Union itself. Now, this kind of flies in the face of the conventional wisdom that the younger generation in Russia is somehow more liberal, more progressive, less tied to the dogmas of the past. The numbers actually show something quite different. If you look at the latest polling, popular approval of Russia, this was in December 2017, popular approval of Russia, 81 percent Russians overall. Among 18 to 24-year-olds, that approval raises to 86 percent. Even more striking is their view on the state of affairs in Russia. Overall, 56 percent of Russians say our country is moving in the right direction. Among 18 to 24-year-olds, that 56 percent grows to 67 percent. Two-thirds of the people who have never known anyone but Putin running their country think things are pretty good, darn good in Russia. The other aspect to consider is the attitude the Russians have towards change itself after this long period of relative political stability in which they've had one leader. Last month, a top Moscow think tank and a polling organization published a study of how Russians understand the idea of change, what kind of changes they would welcome, what kind of changes they dread. The good news is that overall, 80 percent of Russians say they favor change. But this 80 percent is split evenly between around 40 percent who want to see fast, big, radical, comprehensive change and another 40 percent who favor minor, gradual, evolutionary, not so fast change. Interestingly, the 40 percent that want the radical change, these are not the young people who live in the cities. These are mostly older, poorer, lesser educated Russians who live in small towns and even rural areas. By contrast, among that same young Russian cohort that we've been talking about, 18 to 24 year olds, fully 65 percent of them say Russia needs only incremental change or no change at all. 50 percent say only small change. 15 percent say Russia doesn't need to change at all. As for what kind of change we're talking about here, you won't be surprised at all. It is the pocketbook issues, uh, raising living standards, better health care, keeping inflation low. So the bottom line takeaway from all of this, I think, is twofold. First, most Russians realize that their country really can't move forward or even keep pace without change, without reforms, primarily economic reforms. But secondly, they don't have in mind a specific roadmap for those reforms, nor do they have any clear idea of who they want to lead those reforms. Overall, there is little demand for change in Russia, certainly little demand for sweeping change. And the demand that exists comes from the segment of the population that is least well-placed to act on those demands. So to summarize, as Putin begins his fourth term as president, we have a political opposition which is essentially neutered and very well trained. Sounds like a dog. <laughs> and a Russian public that fears change more than demands change and that seems ready to blame just about anybody but Vladimir Putin for the things that they do see wrong in their country. In most countries, the voice of the people and the power of political groupings have the biggest influence on political succession issues like this. In Russia, they have the least. They're, they have only marginal impact. So that leaves the question of who eventually replaces Vladimir Putin. 
and how and when to that third grouping. And that third grouping is Putin himself and the small group of men, and yes, they are almost all men, who have been his closest advisors over the past two decades or even before that. The third term that Putin was just elected to is widely seen as the final one that he will serve in Russia as president. The Russian constitution does not allow him to succeed himself for a third term. And so this is being looked at widely in Russia. And I had a lot of discussions about this when I was there last month with people. This is seen as kind of the transition term in which Putin begins to set the stage for some sort of successor to take the presidency. Because by most accounts, and you can just see this by watching Russian TV, Putin is tired of and bored with running the day-to-day -day affairs of Russia. You need only watch him in his office as he receives the third minister of the day to give a report, and you see him slouched in the chair. Obama once said, I can't have summit meetings with uh, uh, Putin. He's like the bored kid in the back of the classroom, slouched in his chair. Not a, not a wise thing for President Obama to have said, but very accurate. And it describes perfectly what Putin looks like these days. He would welcome, I think, a chance to get out from the ceremonial and official obligations he has. He'll be 72 years old in 2024 when this current six-year term ends. The problem is, of course, the dictator's dilemma. Putin cannot simply retire. There is a much bigger problem here. And this really lies at the heart of the system that Putin has created over his time in power, a system that lacks any institutional or legal guarantees for the fortunes or the personal fates, not just to Putin himself, but also these men, small number of men around him who've grown immensely rich and who have made many enemies over the past two decades. So all of this argues for a mechanism that would allow Putin to retain power and continue to perform this essential sort of balancing role that he plays, balancing the competing forces that surround him and protecting their equities and his own equities. One idea for how to do this is already being floated. I just discussed this with a few people in, in Moscow, and uh, we'll see how quickly it eventuates. It's, it entails the creation of something like a super presidential Supreme State Council. This would be a new executive organ under the Constitution, above the presidency to which Putin could be installed as head. It's similar somewhat to what they created for Lee Kuan Yew after he stepped down in Singapore, president mentor, minister mentor. In this scenario, Putin would be replaced as president by a younger leader maybe the best of the new regional governors that he's taken to appointing over the last six, seven months, or the younger government ministers or officials who we see appearing in the halls of the Kremlin these days. But he would retain a supreme oversight role. And here is really where the preparation for the post-Putin era is beginning already in Moscow. And that is among those people who see themselves as possible contenders to be the next president of Russia. And it might not even be in six years. They could engineer this in five, four years, potentially. And the jockeying that's going on among them, because the one who is chosen must be the least objectionable to the biggest number of people surrounding Putin. And that'll take some time, because there's a lot of money and a lot of power at stake. There are other variants, other scenarios that are possible, including a slow evolution to, to a really more competitive political uh, process. I'd say that's a low percentage probability, but it's not inconceivable. Or more likely, if they run out of time, they could just do a quick constitutional amendment, which allows Putin, like Xi Jinping, to be president for life. They have six years to work all of this out. Remember, when Putin came to power, in 1999-2000, chosen by Yeltsin, he had to make a deal really with one family, the Yeltsin family, protecting their political and financial equities in return for them staying out of politics. Putin and the people around him now have to make that deal times 10, times 12, with fantastically increased financial stakes. So in Russia, the bottom line for us as Americans, is that Putin is highly unlikely to leave the stage anytime 
as long as he remains healthy. And he looks pretty healthy to me. And thus in Russia, preparing for the post-Putin era means working out a way to retain those central features of the system that Putin created over the last 20 years, a system that protects the people in power, that projects Russian strength internationally, and avoids any sharp or prolonged economic downturns domestically. And of course, a system that remains wholly and totally under the control of the Kremlin. That is a long way from the Russia that Gloria and I were working on back in the Clinton administration in the mid-1990s, hoping to see something a little different evolve, but that's where we are. It doesn't sound like there's a lot of space for the US to have a lot of influence, positive minus in this, but I would argue that there might be. And so I look forward to talking about that and also hearing your reactions to all of this I've just had to say as we move through the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great insight. Thank you. So I have a few questions to start off on the domestic uh, environment that you talked about. Just a kind of a, a Russian uh, a primer. When you say that uh, candidates are not allowed to move forward mm -hmm. into real candidacy. How exactly does the government control that? Well, in the case, uh, in, in, there are different ways, but probably the most conspicuous example is Alexei Navalny, uh, who uh, was actually allowed to run for uh, mayor, governor of Moscow uh, several years ago, and he got 25% of the vote, uh, despite the fact that he was not anyone anyone's favorite candidate in power. Um, so what the Kremlin did in his case was they essentially trumped up uh, an embezzlement case against him in one of the regions of uh, Moscow where he had had some business, uh, regions of Russia where he'd had some business dealings. And he was convicted of a felony. You're convicted of a felony, you can't run for president. So that's probably the, the easiest and simplest way that the Kremlin has to do this. and. Uh, for now, it uh, has kept Navalny on the sidelines of presidential elections, but he's still a, a formidable force politically because he has kind of awakened some of the consciousness of, uh, of Russians on this anti-corruption theme. And of course, that, uh, that gets the people surrounding Putin where they live. Mm -hmm. um, if there were a transition to this Supreme Council mentor president, mm -hmm. whatever, for Putin. Um, how would that work? You were, you were talking about how tired he is and uh, bored, uh, so, but not so tired and bored that he wouldn't want to be the uber uh, you know, uh, presence for the Russian government. How do you think that would play out if he did that? Well, it's not really a question of wanting uh, for Putin. He and the people around him are uh, sort of locked into a set of relationships in which they're mutually dependent. Uh, Putin is dependent on the people around him, the, you know, the oligarchs, the head of the security services, the head of the media holdings, uh, to maintain the support for him. The people, obviously, who run the media holdings are, are, play a big role in this in keeping Putin's uh, ratings up. Um, so uh, I don't really think that it's a question of him saying, I'd like to go off and just uh, live in Aruba um, <laughs> first of all, uh, he probably is going to have to stay in Russia for a while. Um, and secondly, there's simply no one else on the political scene who can manage to do what Putin has done so successfully over the last 20 years, and that is be the one to whom everyone defers at the end. Putin is like essentially a Supreme Court justice in another country. When Putin rules, everyone says, okay, fine, you know, maybe I only got 25%, 75%, but that's the way the system works. We need a supreme arbiter. Uh, until someone else appears on the scene uh, to do that, uh, Putin simply can't leave. There's too much at stake. So, but uh, creating this new supreme council would free him uh, from a tremendous burden of the day-to-day 
ceremonial obligations uh, and even uh, meetings with governors. He doesn't do many ribbon cuttings anymore, but uh, it would free him up uh, a bit uh, while maintaining him in that essential oversight role because he really has to be helped uh, and kept in reserve. Uh, if they do go for the Supreme Council variant, if they do choose a new president to replace him, a younger person, uh, that guy is going to be under scrutiny. Uh, at some point, that guy is the one who will have to make the decisions, and unless the system changes completely, which I don't foresee happening in the next 10, 5 to 10 years at least. Uh, and Putin has to be ready to step in if that person isn't up to the job. In a sense, this is a little bit what happened during that four-year interregnum that Putin couldn't succeed himself after his first two terms. And Dmitry Medvedev, who had been his prime minister, became president for those, it was a four-year term at that point. That, that coincided almost uh, precisely with the time I was ambassador in Moscow. And I am convinced, I guess we'll have to wait for Putin's memoirs to test my hypothesis, but I'm convinced that part of Putin hoped that Medvedev would be the strong figure that Putin himself is and would be able to do that, you know, essential Solomonic splitting the, splitting the baby uh, decision-making that Putin has to make on a daily basis. Medvedev, at the end of the day, for many reasons, uh, didn't grow into that job and, more importantly, was never accepted by the people around Putin as that potential next successor arbiter. And the voice of those people is absolutely crucial. So you've been in Russia and in and out of Russia now for decades. Tell us how you see the current economic and social state of affairs in Russia compared to the past, and just uh, how, how are people doing? How's the economy doing? Jobs, uh, development of a, a technology-based yeah. economy? How, how's it all going? Well, you know, it, it's uh, like most assessments. It depends on what your base, <laughs> where you're starting. And, and I start back in 1976 as a student in Leningrad, and obviously things have improved uh, quite a bit. Uh, in those days. But let's just start from, uh, at, look, after the Soviet Union collapsed and uh, Yeltsin's Russia emerged, the time when you and I were working in the Defense Department and the Security Council, we had hopes and were working hard to help Russia make that really unprecedented tra transition. And in many ways, it made the transition economically. Uh, there's no thought at all of returning to a command economy. Russia will be a capitalist market economy for a while. It's crony capitalism as it's evolved, uh, but it's still a country in which people can make money, can get rich. It's not a totalitarian state at all uh, anymore, certainly not on the economic side. On the political side, there was never the... There was never the development of the institutions of governance and civil society that really make a country look and act more like a democracy. You don't have an independent judiciary in Russia. 25 years after the fall of the Soviet Union, the judiciary and the people working in the judiciary still see themselves as working for the government somehow, not being an independent voice. There was a period of about 10 years under Boris Yeltsin in the very beginning of the Putin era when uh, media, especially television state-run media, were free and objective. Uh, Boris Yeltsin was subjected to terrible criticism by state-run media during the 1990s. Uh, Vladimir Putin got a taste of that for his first two or three years, but after some horrific terrorist attacks in Russia, the Beslan massacre of children, the, bomb, the uh, killings in the theater in Moscow. There were a lot of uh, terrorist attacks that took place related to the unrest in Chechnya. Putin used that as a sort of excuse uh, both to crack down on the media and certainly close down any independent voices that went out to the country at large about what was happening in the country. Uh, he also chased the oligarchs who were leading those media holdings out of the country as well. Um, so 
on the media side, on the um, uh, judiciary, and in the legislature as well, you don't have anything at all that approximates the kind of give and take that we as Americans think makes a country stronger. Well, we have some problems of our own in our country right now, so it makes us maybe a little less uh, inclined to, uh, to preach. But by and large, competition in a system in a country is designed to make a country stronger. The Russian experience has been very different than that for a lot of historical reasons. And I would say one of the mistakes we made as Americans was mirror imaging too much, expecting that Russia would change and change itself in our image or West European model image much faster than they were ready to or capable of doing at that time. So I think the question on many people's minds right now is the question of Russian interference in the American election uh, and past election and maybe future elections. So are you, do you believe that there has been Russian interference in the U.S. elections? Uh, I believe what our intelligence agencies uh, told us. And of course, uh, now I read only the uh, unclassified version. But like you, having been in government, you can see what was left out. You can see the evidence that cannot be cited that shows that the direction to do this interference did come from the highest levels of the Russian government. Uh, sad to say, but uh, you know, I think that's almost an incontrovertible fact. The problem that we've got in, in U.S.-Russia relations right now uh, is really twofold, and there's maybe blame to go around on both sides. On the Russian side, there is absolutely no inclination whatsoever to admit that they bear any of the responsibility for that. Uh, Russians are in complete denial mode, and when I was in Moscow last month, I met with some of my former colleagues in the foreign ministry uh, who, uh, who I know very well and who I was dismayed to hear, uh, even in kind of a private conversation, uh, being very, very reluctant to admit uh, anything at all on this score. Uh, I also had dinner with an old friend of mine and uh, someone that I have known. He worked in the foreign ministry for a long time. He's now actually the head of a major uh, American software company in Russia. He's a Russian worked in the foreign ministry. And we had dinner and I said, Andre, look, we've known each other a long time. Do me the favor of not claiming to me that you had nothing to do with this. Can, you know, this, when the old days you and I would talk about how do we fix this problem in the relationship? He said, John, if you Americans could ever stop trying to get us to stand up and admit that we did this, you might be able to get us to sit down and agree that we'll never do it again. <laughs> Now, that sounds like a joke, but there's actually a lot of wisdom and, and truth in that. Uh, the Russians are never going to admit that they did this publicly, and, and here's where we have a problem on our side. We don't have any forums or opportunities in which we can sit down with the Russians and begin to talk seriously about how we do fix this program, uh, this problem in the relationship. Uh, the Trump administration has essentially, in my opinion, lost control of Russia policy to Congress, which knows how to do one thing, and that is punish, levy sanctions. And sanctions are a useful tool, but they're not an end to themselves. At some point, you need to sit down with the sanctioned entity and say, if, as we sense, you may have had enough, then let's talk about what it takes to get the sanctions lifted. This is how it's done. Sanctions only work when they're lifted, because they're lifted as a response to your target changing the behavior. We don't see any inclination on the Russian side to do this, but more importantly, we don't have the contacts with Russia at that level now, and we won't have the contacts, uh, I think, under President Trump. It's almost inconceivable that he'll be able to forge any kind of a relationship with Vladimir Putin. Uh, so we're stuck. We're stalemated for a while. And I think in that case, frankly, we need to make a virtue out of the necessity that we can't have meetings at the highest level. Uh, we used to talk in the days, in the Bill and Boris days, about how there's uh, too much invested in the personal relationship at the top. 
uh, we need to build other things. Well, fine, let's admit that Trump and Putin won't develop a relationship, maybe even shouldn't develop a relationship, and let's move to the next level down in the U.S.-Russia relationship where we have important equities at stake and we have stakeholders on both sides who are not unwilling to talk to each other. And the number one most conspicuous example I would point to is the military-to-military -military context. The single biggest risk that exists in U.S.-Russia relations right now is the, is the risk of an unintended military clash over the skies of Syria or in a buzzing insti uh, incident over the Black Sea. And the more that we can have the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Dunford, talking to his Russian counterpart, which he has done, credit to the Trump administration or to DOD at least and the, and the Joint Staff for realizing that we can't have a vacuum there. Uh, and it, it helped us tremendously just a, a month ago when there was a, quite a clash on the ground in Syria where Russian, uh, about uh, 100, 200 Russian mercenaries in Syria were killed by American airstrikes. Uh, and because the Americans and the Russians were talking about this, because the Russian military uh, was not surprised by it, and also because they were able to distance themselves from these mercenaries, we avoided what could have been a much uh, bigger clash. Uh, also, in terms of that other lower level down, on the uh, business side, we have major American companies, Boeing, Ford, uh, can't, Ernst & Young, help me out here, international, international paper, uh, who are making a lot of money in Russia, who are doing good things, and they're building relationships of trust with important Russians who may rise to levels of uh, official importance in the year to come, years to come. So there, there are areas to do to, for us to be talking to the Russians. We cannot, we don't have the luxury of allowing them to sit in the corner and stew uh, because what we sort of reap from that are the kinds of problems that we're seeing in London uh, and in our own elections. We'll get to London in a second. <laughs> <laughs> One uh, person in the audience wants to know, what is Putin's end game in interfering in American elections, in your opinion? Uh, I don't think he really had an end game. I think he, he succeeded in doing what he set out to do which I think was basically a threefold objective. First of all, uh, in his view, America has been doing the same thing in Russia and the former Soviet Union for the past 20 years, helping foment color revolutions in Georgia and uh, Ukraine, uh, and in fiddling around in Russia and the political system itself. So first of all, he just wanted to show that he could do it. Turnabout is fair play. Uh, secondly, anything that Putin can do to undermine the view that the American model is uh, a model to be emulated in the world uh, plays to his advantage. Uh, it's a very zero-sum world for Putin, and every down for America is seen as an up for Russia. Uh, so I th those are basically a couple of the things. And, and thirdly, he wants to show off his capabilities. Uh, Russia doesn't only have these uh, super missiles that he announced during his uh, campaign speech uh, a couple of, about 10 days ago in Moscow. It also has significant cyber capabilities. And these are cyber capabilities that we've recognized for a long time. And part of Putin showing the world and showing the United States that he is back on the world stage and needs to be taken seriously is demonstrating his reach. And he certainly demonstrated his reach in an unmistakable way. About those poisonings in London, <laughs> explain, if you would, what you think happened there and what the, what the purpose was and what the implications are. Well, in, in Russia, poisoning of political opponents has a long, centuries-long pedigree. This goes back even before the Soviet Union into Tsarist Russia. Rasputin. Yeah. Rasputin was poisoned yeah. uh, by members of the Imperial Russian court. Uh, and through the Soviet Union, there is a list of 10, 12, hard to even count, instances in which Russia used toxins 
to attack people. Most famously, since I served in Bulgaria, at least famous for me, was Georgi Markov, uh, a Bulgarian dissident who was hit with uh, recent pellets on the tip of an umbrella on uh, a bridge in London. I forget which bridge. Blackfires. Sorry? Blackfires. Ah, Blackfires. Blackfires Bridge. So the Russians have been doing this for a very long time. And Putin said in an interview just recently, something that he's been saying consistently for the last 20 years, the one thing that he will never forgive is betrayal, traitorous behavior. Putin comes from the security services. His worldview was shaped by that experience. Uh, spy versus spy, he can understand. He tips his cap to the Foreign Intelligence Service, which manages to get into Russia and do what intelligence services try to do. Uh, he's had a bad case of Mossad envy for decades <laughs> on that score. Uh, but when it's one of his own turning against Russia, uh, that's unpardonable. And the statute of limitations on that is open for a long time, and the people who are running the security services in Russia right now understand that very, very well. I remember uh, back in the, at the end of the 1990s when Yeltsin was still president, there was an interview which was done with a couple of Russian uh, FSB, KGB FSB agents, and they said, we, uh, we are always on a leash in this country, and sometimes we feel the tug of that leash and under Yeltsin, we felt the tug of that leash very, very strongly. Uh, under Putin, they're feeling no tug of the leash at all. There is essentially kind of an open invitation within limits to do things that fulfill the mission. And the mission is to punish people who are traitors towards Russia. U.S. responses, uh, sanctions, any, uh, what's likely, should well, we take action in response? What's likely to be effective? What about England taking responses? Well, I think what responses? we, uh, I think England needs to, in the first instance, I, I think President Trump missed a major opportunity in the phone call to raise this with Putin. I mean, it is absolute malpractice if, in fact, he did not, in this phone call, it's fine if he, if he I don't, it doesn't bother me that he congratulated Putin uh, on his election, despite the fact that in capital letters it said, do not congratulate. I actually thought, just to digress on that for a moment, as someone like you who wrote these talking points for a long time, if you're calling the president of a country who's just won an election, how can you not congratulate him? Why, why, then why are you calling him? So it's kind of odd to begin with uh, that, uh, you know, was not to be congratulated. Uh, but he certainly was to be criticized, uh, both for the interference in the election and for what just happened in London. Uh, you know, and again, it goes back uh, beyond Sergei Skripal. Uh, that didn't happen at all. So it's an opportunity that, that's missed. As far as sanctions go, I, as I've said, I think we have sanctioned and sanctioned Russia. We can levy more sanctions on them, that's fine, but at some point we have to be willing to play the other part of the game, and that is to sit down, hopefully with the Europeans, because our sanctions together with European sanctions are what really have begun to have some economic bite in Russia. But I think uh, what we need to do more than anything is find a way and this is almost impossible to think of now in the current environment in Washington, the just all of the craziness there, and it really is crazy. Uh, at some point, we will need to sit down with Russia and negotiate some sort of a cyber agreement, the way we did in the early arms control days, when we both had tremendous capabilities and we're both chasing each other down a, uh, a road of superiority. We're, we're going to best you. And at some point, we came to our senses and said no. You know, we'll set up the deterrence and then we'll negotiate a standstill, salt, and then reduction, start. We'll need to do that on the cyber side, but it's not going to be a bilateral negotiation. It has to include the Chinese, it has to include the Europeans. This is years down the road. I don't want to say decades down the road, but it absolutely has to be done because the capability of cyber warfare, okay, fine, it's not going to kill. Uh, you know, 300,000 people, but it is as per pernicious and dangerous to the well-being of a country 
in its way as a nuclear attack. Potentially. Speaking of the supposed um, cyber interference capabilities of Russia now in the United States, one would assume that the U.S. has not neglected uh, being similarly equipped to interfere mm -hmm. in Russia, although there may be structural differences and so on that would make U.S. interference less effective than perhaps Russian interference. Can you comment on that? Well, I don't uh, really have uh, direct knowledge of what our capabilities are. I think our capabilities are substantial. Uh, and I think what we're, again, what we're lacking here really is, is a doctrine. I mean, I hate to, to become sort of uh, ar like an arms control wonk on this, but uh, our ability to negotiate uh, the nuclear agreements with Russia and the Soviet Union that really guaranteed the peace during the Cold War, the peace of the world, were based on a very clear view of when and how we would use nuclear weapons and when we wouldn't. And we haven't really made that determination inside the U.S. government yet. We have not yet uh, come up with a doctrine that says, here's what we do and here's what we don't do. There are still people who are... I, uh, I know, I'm, I'm quite sure, inside the U.S. government who are determined to see our capabilities rise to the level of uh, ultimate deterrence. And uh, there are other people who realize that there have to be limits to what we do, or at least what we say we're willing to do. Until we square that circle within the U.S. government, and again, you know, we go back to the days of a real interagency process and real policy. We're just not there in Washington right now. So, but hold that space, hold that thought. We do have to return to that. That is one of the major, one of the major things that we need to get done in the next five to ten years globally. What is U.S.-Russia policy today? Uh, as far as well, you, I mean, you can tell. Yeah, I mean, I think the policy uh, of the Trump administration toward Russia is <laughs> to try to develop a relationship with Vladimir Putin and the people around him that will allow us to defend our interests. I mean, that would be probably what would be stated by people I know who are working on the National Security Council staff now in my old jobs trying to do that. Uh, the problem is that obviously there's a big disconnect between uh, what the agencies, the State Department, the military, the intelligence agencies, National Security Council come up with and what is actually implemented as a policy. There's just tremendous ad hocery uh, going on in Washington right now. Uh, Richard Haas calls it the ad hocracy. And that's a very dangerous way to run a country as uh, big and powerful and influential and potentially beneficially influential as America can be. Let's talk on the positive side for a moment. Um, here's a question. What are the economic opportunities in Russia that could benefit U.S. corporations short term as well as long term? Would you invest in Russia today? I would invest in Russia in, in certain areas. I would make sure that I had a very good lawyer. Uh, I would stay uh, in areas uh, that uh, are sort of well-defined already, uh, software, hardware, technology issues, uh, technology. The technology field in Russia is, uh, is one that I think is ripe for American investment. One of the things that I work on in the U.S.-Russia Foundation, which I and a few other people in, the, in this room serve on the board of, is trying to find ways, and it's very difficult, to help those people in Russia who want to make their country more entrepreneurial, who would like to see the possibility of something like a Silicon Valley develop organically in Russia. Uh, you need a tremendously different ecosystem you know, legally, financially, uh, than exists in Russia right now. But there are people who are committed to that. There are millions of Russians who want a different fate for their country, who don't, even though they're not standing up in the streets, they don't accept the direction that things are being taken. Uh, they don't uh, accept the solutions that are being presented to them. 
And I think as Americans, it's always incumbent on us, although it's a tremendous challenge, to find a way to, to partner with those Russians uh, so that they can win the internal argument. Because there's a tremendous debate always going on in Russia about which way we Russians, they say, will take the country. Are we taking it in this direction and that direction? Well, we obviously have a stake in that uh, debate. We're never going to have a real voice in it, but we have a stake in making sure that that direction in the end comes out on top. And that's where American investment in Russia can help, where the work that we're still doing in the nonprofit sector, non-governmental sector works. Uh, and as hard as it is, we just need to keep at it. So no, I wouldn't dissuade anyone at all from investing in Russia, but eyes wide open and sure. good lawyer. Sure. So um, we have a mutual friend in the audience, Steve Pease, who's a longtime Commonwealth Club member and who chairs the board of the U.S.-Russia Foundation. He's my boss. And so could you, t and also actually suggested that we invite Dr. B uh, uh, Ambassador Byerly to speak. Could you tell us a little bit about that foundation and its interesting history? Where, where did it come from? After the Soviet Union fell apart, uh, U.S. Congress funded a number of investment funds in Russia and the countries of the former Soviet Union, which were designed to kind of jumpstart the market economy and entrepreneurship. Uh, these investment funds took on some of the smartest minds in entrepreneurship in America who worked pro bono for 10 years, essentially doing private equity work in Russia, looking at would-be enterprises, distressed enterprises, and helping them improve and create capital, make money. And in the case of the U.S.-Russia Investment Fund, I think it was about an initial $300 million 330 million of uh, taxpayer dollars uh, was invested, and uh, at the end, when the fund liquidated, when it was determined that Russia, pretty much a market economy now, uh, we have other ways of helping entrepreneurship, we can stand down the investment fund, Congress said the proceeds that uh, were realized from this, because these were investment funds, they were making money, uh, can be essentially plowed into a new charitable foundation. And the mission of those foundations, in this case the U.S. Russia Foundation, is to continue doing what the investment funds did, continue to help entrepreneurship, would-be entrepreneurs, the market economy in Russia solidify itself. And it's uh, in many ways easier now, 20 years down the road, because there are so many Russians now who understand the way a real economy works, uh, who many of whom work live and work here in Silicon Valley or other places uh, in the United States or around the world and who go back to Russia and want to help that uh, change, that incredible transition, really solidify itself. So the U.S.-Russia Foundation now tries to help those Russians in Russia partner with them, universities, for example who uh, up until about uh, five or six years ago couldn't open, you couldn't open a research center as part of a Russian university. Research belonged to the Academy of Sciences. Universities were supposed to teach. And I guess it was more like 10 years ago, they changed the law which allowed Russian universities to develop intellectual property, to patent it, and to reap the proceeds from any sales of that property. Well, the Russian university said, this sounds great, but we don't know how to do this. How do, where do we go? Who wrote the book on this? American universities wrote the book on how to do this. So we in the U.S.-Russia Foundation built bridges between American universities and Russian research universities and essentially showed them how they could do this, how you set up a tech center, what you need to make it work, What's the legal environment? What laws do you need to get passed to allow you to implement the, this idea? So that's the sort of thing, one really good example, probably shining example of what we were able to do in the U.S.-Russia Foundation. Unfortunately, we fell victim to the worsening climate in U.S.-Russia relations about uh, four years ago, and 
this foundation, which, which was actually founded by Presidents Bush and Putin at the 2006 G8 summit, uh, the Russians declared it an undesirable for a foreign organization, and they made us close our Moscow office. Uh, we've re-headquartered. We're in Washington, D.C. now. We have a new CEO, and we still have a substantial foundation and are working hard with a lot of uh, people, like-minded people, uh, who are hopeful to see Russia continue to move in the right direction. What else is this going on? Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> what else is going on in the U.S.-Russian relationship that's positive? Um, International Space Station. I mean, there are parts of the U.S.-Russia relationship which are really somehow hived off and immune from uh, some of this other nonsense that we're living through. And, and obviously, the and, and maybe in a way, um, paradoxically, the space relationship, which could have been militarized beyond recognition uh, back in the 60s and 70s, took a totally different path. Uh, really in the 70s after Apollo Soyuz. And we and the Russians are the joint stewards of the International Space Station right now, the only uh, international space entity that exists. And we've got Russians and Americans working up there and on the ground in Moscow and in Houston on this 24-7, 365. So that's very positive. There's also still a tremendous amount of exchange between the societies, which is not, which is always endangered by these political downturns. Uh, and you have to work harder to keep the student exchanges and the cultural things going. But there's still a lot of that that takes place. Still a lot of Russian students who come to the United States to study, and still a lot of Russian students, uh, American students, American cultural uh, performing arts groups which travel around um, Russia. And that's the sort of thing, especially at times when the relationship politically is in as bad shape as it seems to be, that we need to work extra hard to keep going. Because the Russian and American people uh, sometimes need to tell their governments to sit down and uh, shut up and uh, <laughs> uh, let, us, let, it, let us handle things on our own. It's not, it's not quite as simple as that. Uh, obviously, it's a more complicated world. Um, but, you know, uh, Dwight Eisenhower said something in the 1950s that it was probably the most subversive thing that a U.S. president has ever said. And he said it in the context of U.S.-Soviet relations at the time. He said sometimes uh, people need to go around governments. They need to evade their own governments and set up a thousand different connections with Russia uh, because that's where the business actually gets done. Who knew that General Eisenhower was a was kind of Abby Hoffman in disguise. <laughs> <laughs> is there a way to better U.S.-Russia relations, just playing off your last question, that does not depend on the controversial relationship be between Trump and Putin? Yeah, I mean, the, the point that I've made, you, uh, you can get a lot done in the U.S.-Russia relationship, or at least you can keep things from falling into real disrepair if you keep the elemental relationships at the military, business, and societal levels going. And despite, uh, look, a lot of lights have been shut off in the U.S.-Russia relationship over the last eight years. Uh, and so some of those were shut off on the U.S. side, and I think they were done mistakenly. Some of them were done by the Russians, stopping adoptions of uh, Russian kids by American parents. What, what the hell was that about? It's absolutely crazy. So you have to work harder on that, uh, but it's, it's quite possible uh, and even noble to do it. The U.S.-Soviet and U.S.-Russian relationship has tended to be very cyclical. Uh, it's been very predictable that there have been ups and downs and then additional ups and downs. Given the nature of it where uh, it's, you make a couple steps forward and then you take steps back and steps forward again, are you glad that you went into this field uh, after a career of 40 years plus? Oh, yeah. Plus? No, no, no. I don't have really very many regrets at all. Uh, and look, uh, you know, when it comes to the cyclical nature of the U.S. or Soviet and U.S.-Russia relationship, I, I lived it. I got to Moscow as a young junior officer in 1983. My first tour, U.S. Embassy, Moscow, Ronald Reagan gives the 
evil empire speech, the Russians shoot down a Korean, Korean airliner, airliner or over yeah. Sakhalin, yeah. and people said to me, well, you made a really good choice. That's sort of uh -huh. the end of your career. Uh, and within four years, Ronald, I was accompanying Ronald Reagan to his meeting with Gorbachev in Moscow in 1988. So things happened quickly. The same thing happened in, in, to a smaller degree when I arrived in Moscow as ambassador in 2008, which was right after the Russian-Georgian War of August of 2008. And it was the end of the Bush administration. We tried to levy sanctions on Russia. And again, people said, poison chalice, you know. Uh, and within a year, Obama and President Medvedev were meeting to sign the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, the New START Treaty, which is still lowering the levels of nuclear warheads and continuing the inspections and the monitoring on both sides that's so important. So we actually got a lot done during this much maligned reset. Uh, the problem, as your questioner alludes to, is the, not that the resets don't produce results, it's that they never last. And when they fall apart, they're usually followed by the period of rancor and disagreement that we're in right now. But there is a difference this time. I'm not predicting a quick rebound, nothing at all like we saw in the reset or 83 to, let's say, 88, uh, because Putin really has charted a different course for Russia, uh, <coughs> which does not perceive a partnership with the West and the United States as in any way a part of Russia's supreme national interests and, in fact, sees Russia's strength as shown by the degree to which it can push back against U.S. hegemony, a word that he's actually taken to using now, sounding more and more Chinese. So, on the other hand, we can, this relationship does go up and down, and so doubtless things will improve. Mr. Putin will eventually leave the stage. Uh, things will change in the U.S., and so I expect to see another up cycle at some time in our lifetimes. It's guaranteed full-time employment and interesting <laughs> employment for Russia hands. There's no yeah. question about that. And when I talk at universities, as I do a lot, uh, I find, a, sad to say, a lot of interest in studying Russia and Russian again. It takes a downturn to pull us away from the pivot to Arabic and Chinese that we were on for a while. Russia matters. <laughs> Russia matters, will always matter. And uh, so for anyone in the sound of my voice who's thinking about pursuing that as a career and thinking, well, it might actually not be something worth it, you'll be busy well, well through the end of this century. Well, on that note, I'd like to thank John Byerly, former U.S. Ambassador to Russia, for being with us, uh, to everyone here for all your great questions, and to your lifetime of service in this field, John. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thanks. Russian style. <laughs>